Hi student, this is Professor Harmony Kim. Today you will study Abhidhamma Pitaka. So far we studied Sutanta Pitaka. So we study five kinds of Nikaya so far. And today you will study Abhidhamma Pitaka. What is Abhidhamma Pitaka? Abhidhamma is the third great division of the Pitaka. It is a huge collection of a systematically arranged and classified doctrine of the Buddha. It represents the quintessence of Buddha's teaching. Abhidharma, Abhi, means higher teaching or special teaching. It is unique in its analytical approach, immensity of scope, and conduciveness to one's liberation. So far, you studied Sutta Pitaka. In Sutta discourses, the Buddha takes into consideration the intellectual level of his audience and their attainment in Paramita. Therefore, the Buddha teaches the Dharma in prevailing conventional terms such as cow, tree, mountain, I, you, she, he, etc. And using those terms make references to persons and object. But in Abhidhamma, the Buddha makes no such things granted. The Buddha treats the Dharma entirely in terms of ultimate reality. He analyzes every phenomenon into its ultimate constituent. All relative concepts such as man, mountain, tree, etc. are reduced into their ultimate element which are then precisely defined, classified, and systematically arranged. Unlike the Nikaya, Abhidhamma is not discourse and discussion occurring in real-life setting. They are rather fully developed treatises in which the principles of the doctrines have been methodologically organized, minutely defined, and meticulously arranged and classified. Let's think about the origin of Abhidharma, the genesis of Abhidharma. Modern critical scholarship attempts to explain the formation of Abhidharma by a gradual evolutionary process. In other words, Abhidharma is formed by the disciples in the process of compilation. Theravada orthodoxy assigns its genesis to the Buddha himself. In other words, Abhidharma is an authentic world of the Buddha. Akariya Buddhaghosa addressed that what is known as Abhidhamma is not the province nor the sphere of a disciple. It is the province, the sphere of the Buddhas. Even Pali commentarial tradition holds that Abhidhamma was expounded by the Buddha during his lifetime. The Buddha expounded the Abhidhamma not in the human world to his human disciples, but to the assembly of divas or gods in Tabatimsa heaven. Just prior to his seventh annual reign retreat, the Buddha ascended to the Tabatimsa heaven and there the Buddha taught Abhidhamma for the three months of the rain season to the diva who had assembled from the 10,000 world system. The Buddha made the chief recipient of the teaching his mother, Mahamaya Devi, who had been reborn as a diva. So, Buddha's mother died after giving a birth of Gautama Siddhartha, and Buddha's mother had been reborn as a diva. So, once the Buddha ascended to the Tabatinsa heaven, then the Buddha made a chief recipient of his teaching to his mother. Then, why the Buddha taught the Abhidhamma in the deeper world rather than in the human realm? Because, in order to give a complete picture of Abhidharma, 
it has to be expounded from the beginning to the end to the same audience in a single session. Since the full exposition of the Abhidharma requires three months, only Diva and Brahmas could receive it in unbroken continuity because they alone are capable of remaining in one posture for such a long time. Here, such a, a length of time means three months of rainy season. However, the Buddha was a human being. In order to sustain human body, each day the Buddha would descend from Tabatimsa heaven to the human world to go on alms round, and after collecting alms food, he went to the shore to partake his meal. At the time, the elder Sariputta, the general of the Dhamma, would meet the Buddha there and receive a synopsis of the teaching given that day in the Diva world. One of the commentary mentioned that, then to him the teacher gave the method, saying, Sariputta, so much doctrine has been shown. Thus, the giving of the method was to the chief disciple, who was endowed with analytical knowledge, as though the Buddha stood on the edge of the shore and pointed out the ocean with his open hand. To the elder, also the doctrine taught by the Buddha in hundreds and thousands of methods became very clear. Having learned the Dhamma, Sariputta in turn taught it to his own circle of 500 pupils, and thus the textual recension of the Abhidhamma Pitaka was established. To the Venerable Sariputta is ascribed the textual order of the Abhidhamma treatise as well as the numerical series in the Patana. If we can invite guest lecturer in this course, maybe we can invite Professor Richard Jones, and then he is going to provide origination of Abhidharma. So you will watch his speech. Traditionally, it was said that in the fourth week after his enlightenment, the Buddha contemplated the Abhidhamma working out the complexities of what it was that he was looking at. Tradition also says that he taught the Abhidhamma to his mother. <coughs> his mother had died seven days after giving birth and had been reborn in the Tusita heaven. If you like to take the chart, planes of existence, you will see that on the lower page there are Deva Loka or celestial planes, and one of those is Tusita. And two down from there is the first is Yama, and then there's Tavatinsa. Tradition has it that his mother came from the um, Tusita heaven to the Tavatinsa heaven, and the Buddha gave the teaching in the Tavatinsa heaven. The reason he had to go there was that he wanted to teach the Abhidhamma in one unbroken teaching. A heavenly day was long enough to do this, but an earthly day was not. And it is said that he would teach during the time of the earthly day and then at the earthly night, he would return to the human plane and tell his chief disciple, 
Sariputta, what he had been teaching, and then Sariputta was the man who codified the teaching. <coughs> if you find this a little doubtful, a little difficult to swallow, you can take a purely um, psychological interpretation. You can say that the Buddha spent periods on, of intense, deep, deep meditation in which he worked out this Abhidhamma. Yes, so you can say that the, the Buddha could perhaps have worked out the Abhidhamma during periods of intense meditation and then came back to normal human level of consciousness and instructed Sariputta. Abhidhamma has been highly respected during the many centuries and in one case it was all inscribed on gold plates by one of the Sri Lankan kings and one particular book was set with jewels. It is especially revered in the country of Myanmar where monks in their monastic training are required to learn and memorize this summary which I mentioned, the Abhidhamma Sangaha. To give you an idea of um, the high regard which people have for the Abhidhamma, if you look at the great commentator Buddha Gosa, in his commentary called the Expositor, he says, Tradition has it that those monks only who know Abhidhamma are true preachers of the Dhamma. The rest, though they speak on the Abhidhamma, are not preachers thereof. And why? They, in speaking on the Abhidhamma, confuse the different kinds of Kama and its results, the distinction between mind and matter, and the different kinds of mental states. The students of Abhidhamma do not thus get confused. Hence a monk who knows Abhidhamma, whether he preaches the Dhamma or not, will be able to answer questions whenever asked. He alone, therefore, is a true preacher of the Dhamma. And we find also in a commentary to the Mahagosinga Sutta. One who is ignorant of Abhidhamma is also ignorant of what are right views and what are wrong views, of what is Buddhist philosophy, and what is misleading philosophy. And in talking in ignorance, he may talk of Buddhist philosophy as misleading philosophy, and misleading philosophy as Buddhist philosophy. Right views as wrong views, and wrong views as right views. He may get confused, muddled in mind, or mix up the true Dhamma with extraneous things or false Dhamma. And the false Dhamma as the true Dhamma. So, next question is, what exactly is Abhidhamma? Okay, let's move to uh, more about Abhidhamma Pitaka. First, there are two kinds of method 
you have to know about. The first is Sutta method of analysis. The second one is Abhidhamma method of analysis. So the way preaching the Buddha's discourse is different between Sutta Pitaka and Abhidhamma Pitaka. In other words, they use different kinds of method. So first, Sutta method of analysis. When the Buddha spoke discourses, the Buddha sizes up the inclination and attitude of his audience and adjusts the presentation of the teaching. Suttas are primarily pedagogical in intent, so the Buddha used simile and metaphor to adjust the presentation of the teaching. The Suttanta Pitaka contains discourses dealing with discussions and conditional relationships of the five aggregates, five khanda. Subjects such as five khanda, ayatana, datu, etc. are mentioned in the sutta discourses whenever the need arises. But they are explained only briefly by what is known as the sutta method of analysis. Sutta method analysis means giving bare definition with limited description. For example, Five khandas are enumerated as the corporeal aggregate, aggregate of sensation, the aggregate of perception, the aggregate of mental formation, mental formation means volitional activities, and aggregate of consciousness. They may be dealt with a little more comprehensively. For instance, the corporeal aggregate may be further defined as corporeality of the past, the present, or the future. The corporeality, which is internal or external, coarse or fine, inferior or superior, far or near. You will read this phrase many times in the Five Nikaya. This method of analysis in the Five Nikaya does not usually go further than this definition. For this reason, the Sutta method of teaching is described as figurative, metaphorical, or embellished discourses on the Dhamma. On the contrary, Abhidhamma takes no count of personal inclination and cognitive capacities of the listeners. Abhidhamma is devoid of uh, literary embellishment and pedagogical expedient. Thus, in Abhidhamma, everything is expressed in terms of five khanda, twelve ayatana, eighteen datu, indriya, and saka, and so on. Here, five khanda, you already know the five aggregates of existence. 12 ayatana means five sensory organ and mind and their respective sense object. So in Buddhism, mind can be regarded as one kind of sensory organ. So six sensory system, six sensory organ, therefore five sensory organ plus mind and their respective sense object also six kinds of sense objects, so total 12 ayatana. 18 datu means 18 element. You will add up six kinds of consciousness to 12 ayatana equal 18 element. Indriya, faculties, saka, truth. So relative conceptual objects such as man, woman, I, you, mountain, tree, those are reserved into ultimate component of khanda, ayatana, datu, indriya, and saka. Relative conceptual objects are viewed as an impersonal psychophysical phenomena. These impersonal psychophysical phenomena are conditioned by various factors 
but they share common characteristics such as impermanence, anicca, suffering, dukkha, and without a permanent entity, anatta. Abhidhamma resolve all phenomena into ultimate component analytically. Abhidhamma defines inner relations between the various constituent factors. Thus, Abhidhamma forms a gigantic edifice of knowledge relating to the ultimate realities which, in its immensity of scope, grandeur, subtlety, and profundity, properly belongs only to the intellectual domain of the Buddha. As I said, the Abhidhamma approach is more thorough, more penetrating, breaking down each corporeal or mental component of the five kinds into the ultimate, the most infinitesimal unit. For example, Rupa Kanda, corporeal aggregate, has been analyzed into 28 constituent. Vedana Kanda, the aggregate of sensation, has been an analyzed into five constituent. Sanya Kanda, the aggregate of perception, analyzed into six constituent. Sankara Kanda, the aggregate of mental formation analyzed into 50 constituent. The Vinyana Kanda analyzed into 89 constituent. Then each constituent part is meticulously described with its properties and qualities and well defined and arranged in the systems of classification. A complete description of things requires also a statement of how each component part stands in relation to other component parts. This entails a study of the inner relationship between constituent parts and how they are related to other internal and external factors. Upon you studying Abhidhamma, you need to know about two kinds of truth or two kinds of knowledge. So there are two kinds of truth. One is conventional truth, the other one is ultimate truth. These two kinds of truth is also related to two kinds of method which I introduced in the previous slide. I introduced two methods in the previous slide. One is Sutta method of analysis. The other one is Abhidhamma method of analysis. The differences in technique between the two methods influence their respective terminology. In the Sutta, the Buddha regularly make use of conventional language and accept conventional truth. And this conventional truth expressed in terms of entities that do not possess ontological ultimacy, but can still be legitimately referred to them. The Buddha speaks of I and you, man, woman, of living beings, persons, and even self, as if they were concrete realities. In the Abhidharma, only four categories of things are classed as the ultimate truth. And those are mind, consciousness, mental concomitant, materiality, and nirvana. Therefore, all the rest are regarded as a conventional truth. The Abhidhamma method of analysis restricts itself to terms that are valid from the standpoint of ultimate truth. So the expression as I, you, man, woman, person, individual do not exist in reality because the ultimate truth is that there is no person, no individual, or no I in reality. For example, khandas are made up of corporeality, mind consciousness, and mental concomitant. These are real in that 
They are not just designation. They actually exist in us or around us. Abhidham approach is breaking down each corporeal and mental component of the five khandas into the ultimate, the most infinitesimal unit. Let's see how Abhidhamma break down one thought into the infinitesimal unit. This is an example of how cognitive process is illuminated in Abhidharma. Here, illustrate the cognitive process occurring in the sense doors with a simile of the mango. A certain man with his head covered went to sleep at the foot of a fruiting mango tree. And then a ripe mango loosened from the stalk fell to the ground, grazing his ear. Awakened by the sound, he opened his eyes and looked. Then he stretched out his hand, took the fruit, squeezed it, and smelled it. Having done so, he ate the mango swallowed it appreciating its taste and then went back to sleep. Here the time of the man sleeping at the foot of a mango tree is like the time when the babanga is occurring. The instant of the ripe mango falling from his stalk and grazing his ear is like the instant of a zag striking one of the sense organs, for instance the eye. Or ear. The time of awaking through the sound is like that of the five door adverting consciousness turning toward the object. So Abhidhamma elucidate the cognitive process in the five sense door, which is composed of 70 moments per each round of thought avenue. So one thought, we think that very short brief moment of one thought is composed of a 17 moment and each moment is infinitesimal unit. 17 moments are sub-categorized in three babangas and 14 stages of consciousness. Let's imagine one man was sleeping under the mango tree. A mango fell from the tree and touched his ear with the sound. He became awakened, opened his eyes, and see the mango. He grabbed and smelled the mango and eat the mango. Upon swallowing the mango, he appreciates its taste, and then the man goes back to sleep. How this phenomenon analyzed into 17 cognitive process? Here, the time of the man's sleeping at the foot of the mango tree is like the time when the babanga is occurring. Here, the first three babanga. The instant of the ripe mango falling from the tree and grazing his ear is like the instant of the object striking one of the sense organs, for instance, the ear. The time of awakening by the sound is like that the five door adverting consciousness turning toward the object that is advert. The time of the man's opening his eyes and looking is like eye consciousness accomplishing its function of seeing. Here's the fifth moment sense. The time of stretching out his hand and taking the mango is like that of the receiving consciousness, receiving the object. So the sixth stage, receive. The time of squeezing the fruit is like that of the investigating consciousness, investigating the object, such as examine. The time of smelling the mango is like that of determining consciousness, determining the object, establishment. So the time of eating the mango is like that of javana experiencing the flavor of the object. The swallowing of the fruit while appreciating its taste is like the registration process taking the same object as the javana phase. So 
during jhavana you build up some kinds of experience and that experience is registered into memory now once you pass through this uh, registration stage then the man going back to sleep like the subsidence back into babanga and then you will repeat these 17 stage of sense door process whenever your six sense organ contact to six sensory object now the five sense door this is a five sense door process five sense door is not sufficient to present the attribute of a sense object in other words, when you eat mango, you already remember its shape and taste. So you can describe to other people, oh, the mango sweet, soft, delicious. Sense door process. You, you are just a, a sense organ, contact sensory object. That's it. Sense door is not sufficient to present the attribute of a sense object. In other words, the mind door process should be accompanied with a cognition that is describing the feeling of color, representing the phenomena, or describing the taste of mango, etc. So, sense door immediately followed by mind door process. So, we think that, you know, just uh, just saying that oh mango is delicious it's already very short time but in that short time there's infinitesimal unit of moment is already occur we cannot recognize so what is a mind door process mind door process the transition from the five sense door to the mind door is described in Abhidhamma. The five sense door is not sufficient. I told you that. Okay, so mind door process should be accompanied with a cognition. For example, when you look at blue sky and saying, oh, clear blue sky, so beautiful. Seeing the blue sky by your eyes can occur through sense door process. And this needs to be followed by mind door process for describing the feeling of color or clearness of sky. Whenever you represent the phenomena, applying sense information for a particular purpose, those are the examples of the mind door process. So Abhidhamma illustrate the transition from the five sense door to the mind door as an eye process is followed by first by a com conformational mind door process which reproduce the object just perceived in the sense door process in the mind door through your sense door process you still do not recognize yourself to have a sense of that sensory object once sense door process followed by mind door process then you can describe your experience so language is always path through this mind door process it's an ordinary sequence is sense door process followed by mind door process then you can represent your perception then how mind door process operate unlike the five sense door process mind door process does not have three moments such as receiving determining i'm sorry receiving investigating and determining so go back to this slide this receive examine and establishment receiving investigate determine these three stages do not exist in mind door process so three moments such as receiving for example stretching out his hand and taking the mango investigating squeezing the fruit for investigation of the object 
and determining seeing and smelling to determine the mango do not take place in the mind door process. When you see mango first time, sense door process, as uh, for example, eye door process take place and then followed by mind door process. In the second time when you see the mango, you already have experience. So eye is adverted through eye door process and then immediately reaching the visual recognition by way of a mind door advert. Mind door advert is matured, so receiving, investigating, and determining are not required. Your eyes see mango, and then through mind door uh, advert, and then you don't have to repeat, receive, investigate, and determining moment and then you immediately go to Javana, which engages in wholesome and unwholesome consciousness. And the concept of self is formed. So during this uh, running stage, you can have, uh, I like mango. Oh, I don't like mango. There's some flavor come out. I don't like that. That kind of concept can be added through in this stage. So wholesome and unwholesome consciousness and the concept of self is formed during this Javana stage. The next stage is uh, registering, which puts the cognitive process up to Javana on the memory. So whenever you see the mango, you already know, you already have uh, some information in your mem from memory, but because you already passed through this process. This is the way how Abhidhamma analyzed the thought process moment by moment with respect to consciousness. It's quite complicated. Thus, Abhidhamma approach covers a wide field of study consisting of analytical method of investigation describing meticulously the constituent part of aggregate and finally setting out conditions in which they are related to each other. Such a large scope of intellectual endeavor needs to be encompassed in a classified compilation. Hence, Abhidhamma Pitaka is made up of seven massive treaties. They are Dhammasangani, Vivanga, Dutakata, Pugala Panati, Katavatu, Yamaka, and Patana. Dhamma Sangani, another name is enumeration of phenomena, containing detailed enumeration of all phenomena with an analysis of consciousness and its concomitant mental factors, Chitta and Chitta Vivanga Book of Analysis, consisting of 18 separate sections on analysis of phenomena quite distinct from that of Dhamma Sangani. Dutta Kata Discourses of Element, a small treatise written in the form of a catechism, discussing all phenomena of existence with reference to three categories. Five Kanda, Twelve Ayatana, and Eighteen Datu. Pugala Panati, Concept of Individual, a small treatise giving a description of various parts of individuals according to the stage of their achievement along the path. So, Pugala Panati is more close to the Sutta method of analysis compared to the rest uh, part of uh, treatise. Katava II, Point of Controversy, a compilation by the Venerable Mogaliputta, the presiding Terra of the Third Great Synod, in which he discusses and refutes doctrines of other school in order to uproot all the points of controversy on the Buddha Dhamma. Yamaka, Book of Pairs, regarded as a treatise on applied logic in which Analytical procedure is arranged in pairs. Patana, Book of Conditional Relations, 
a gigantic treatise which all together with the Dhammasangani constitute the quintessence of Abhidhamma Pitaka. It is a meticulously detailed study of the doctrine of conditionality based on 24 conditions or relations. So, among seven treaties, Dhammasangani, the first book of the Abhidhamma, and Patana, the last book, are most important of the seven treaties of Abhidhamma, providing as they do the quintessence of the entire Abhidhamma. So let's look at each treatise briefly. Dhamma Sangani, the first book of the Abhidhamma, and contain detailed enumeration of all phenomena with an analysis of citta, consciousness, and chetasika, mental concomitant. The Masangani is divided into four chapters. First one is Matika, second the four division, third is the classification of the types of consciousness. The last chapter is Rupakanda. Matika, what is Matika? The Dhammasangani begin with a complete list of head called the Matika. The Matika serve as a classified table of mental constituent treated not only in the Dhammasangani but in the entire system of Abhidhamma. The Matika consists altogether of 122 groups. The first 22 are called the Tikas or Triad, and those are divided on the three heads. The remaining 100 are called Dukas or Diads, and they are divided on the two heads. So, let's look at first 22 modes of Triad. Each Triad set of three terms into which the fundamental Dhammas are to be distributed. For instance, the triad include a set of dharma stating that are wholesome, unwholesome, and indeterminate. The matrix embraces the totality of phenomena and serves as a kind of grid, G-R-I-D, kind of a grid for sorting out complex manifold of experience in accordance with a variety of angles, philosophical angle, psychological angle, and ethical angle in nature. Here is another example of a triad which are divided on the three heads. Vedanatika are divided on the three heads, pleasant feeling, painful feeling, and neutral feeling. The remaining 100 modes are called the Dukas or Dayad, and they are divided on the two heads. Here are the example of Dayad, had to, had to Dukha. Had to means cause, condition, or reason. Had to has a wholesome and unwholesome root, and the Saituka with and without concomitant root condition. Somatika concludes with a list of categories of Dhamma. Based on these Matikas, the Dhamma Sangani is divided into four divisions. The first division is Situpada Kanda, division of the arising of consciousness and mental concomitant. Second division is Rupa Kanda, division concerning corporeality. Third division, Nikepa Kanda, division that avoid elaboration. The last division, Atakata Kanda, division of a supplementary digest. Of the four divisions, the first two divisions, such as Situpada Kanda and Rupa Kanda, form the main and essential portion of the book. They set the method of thorough investigation into the nature, properties, function, and in a relationship with each of the dharma listed in the matika. 
They provide a sample analysis and review of the first tikka, namely Kusala tikka of Kusala, Akusala, and Abhyakata Dhamma. Siddhupada Kanda deals with a complete enumeration of all the state of mind that comes under the headings of Kusala and Akusala. Kusala means wholesome, Akusala means unwholesome. The Rupa Kanda is concerned with all state of matter that come under the heading of Abhyakata. Abhyakata means indeterminate. The Nikepa Kanda gives the summary of distribution of all the tikas and dukas so that their full contents and significance will become fully covered. Atakada Kanda gives a summary of dhammas under the different heads of tika and dukkha groups. Atakada Kanda provides the summary in a more condensed manner, thus forming a supplementary digest of the first book of the Abhidhamma for ease memorizing. You can see this Kusala Dhamma, Kusala, and Abhyakata Dhamma is indeterminate. And you can read this part, but the bottom part, one more thing you have to pay attention to Dhamma Sangani is the types of consciousness with regard to the plane or sphere of consciousness. So, uh, Kamabachara is a sensuous plane, Rupabachara, plane of form. Arupavachara, plane of no form. Tebumaka, pertaining to all the three planes. Lokutara, supramundane, not pertaining to the three planes. According to different sphere, different types of consciousness can be engaged. So types of consciousness for each plane is further divided into various kinds of chitta consciousness. So for example, there are eight kinds of kusala dhamma for the sensuous plane. In sensuous sphere, the kusala means wholesome dhamma. There are eight kinds of wholesome consciousness there. And different sphere, they have different types of consciousness exist. So we look at Dhamma Sangani, let's move to uh, Vivanga. Vivanga is referred to as the book of analysis. Vivanga, together with the first book, Dhamma Sangani, and the third book, you will study uh, Datukata a little bit later, forms a closely related foundation for the proper and deep understanding of the Buddha's Dhamma. Vivanga gives a closer view of a selected portion of those dharma in meticulously details. Vivanga provides full knowledge concerning Kanda, Ayatana, Datu, Indriya, and the stated exact nature of each dharma and its constituent and its relationship to other dharmas. Vivanga is divided into 18 chapters, and each chapter deals with a particular aspect of the Dharma. For example, the first chapter, Kanda, aggregate, second, Ayatana, sense basis, Datu, element, Saka, truth, Indriya, faculties, Patika Samupada, dependent arising, Satipatthana, foundation of mindfulness, Sammapadana, Supreme effort, idipada, means of accomplishment, bozanga, factors of enlightenment, maga, the eightfold path, jhana, you know the jhana, or advanced mental state, apamana, illimitable, sikapada, training rules, patisambhida, analytical knowledge, nana, kinds of knowledge, kutakabhatu, minor point, dhammadaya, the heart of doctrine. When you look at this 
eighteen chapters. Uh, the first group from number one through six deals with the mental and corporeal constituent of beings and two laws of nature, such as the law of impermanence and the law of dependent origination, can apply. The second group containing from 7 to 12 is concerning with the practice of holy life, which will take being out of suffering and rounds of existence. The remaining six categories serve as a supplement to the first two groups, supplying fuller information and details where necessary. The third treatise, Datukata, Datukata studies how the Dhamma listed in the Matika are related to the three categories of Kanda, Ayatana, and Datu in their complete. Datukata discusses all phenomena with reference to the three schemata, such as five aggregate, twelve sense bases, eighteen element and seek to determine whether phenomena are include or not include, whether phenomena are associated or dissociated in them. There are discussions in 14 ways of analytical investigation which constitute the 14 chapters of Datukata. The first Treatise is Pugala Panati. The first three books, such as Dhamma Sangani, Vivanga, and Datukata, investigate the absolute truth of Dhamma in a planned system of detailed analysis. And these three books employ terms of Kanda, Ayatana, Datu, Indriya, Saka. These terms are mere designations which express things that exist in reality. As these terms have been elaborately dealt with in the first three books, this fourth book, Pugala Panati, briefly deal with Kanda, Ayatana, and Datu. So the Pugala Panati begins with a general enumeration of types of concepts. And this indicates that it was originally intended as a supplement to the other three books. The terms concerning individuals are given more weight and space in the treatise. Hence, its title, Pugala Panati. Pugala means individual. So Pugala Panati means designation of individual. Different types of individuals are classified in 10 chapters of the book. The first deals with single types of individual, the second with pairs, the third with groups of three. The fifth book, Katavatu, Point of a Controversy. Katavatu does not directly deal with the abstruse nature of the Dhamma. It is concerned with wrong view, such as person exists, self exists, ziva exists, or arahan falls away from arahanship, which arose after the parinirvana of the Buddha. About 218 years after parinirvana of the Buddha, there were 18 sects, and these sects claim to be followers of the Buddha's teaching. Out of these, only the Theravadas were truly orthodox, while the rest were all schematic. The Emperor Asoka set about removing the impure elements from the order with the guidance and assistance of the elder Mogaliputatissa. Mogaliputatissa is Arahan. Under his direction, the order held a Uposada ceremony and at the assembly, the Venerable Mogaliputatissa 
expounded on point of views made up of 500 orthodox statements and 500 statements of other views in order to refute the wrong views that had crept into the Sangha and then might in the future arise again. The collection of statement of views was recited by 1,000 selected teras and incorporated into the Abhidhamma Pitaka. The style of compilation of these treaties is quite different from that of other treaties. Kataba II is written in the form of a dialogue between two imaginary debaters one holding the heterodox views of a different sect and the other representing the orthodox views. The sixth treatise is Yamaka. Dhammasangani, Vibhanga, and Tatukata examine the Dhamma and their classification as they exist in the world of reality, named Sankala Loka. Pugala Panati and Katavatu deals with beings and individuals which also exist in their own world of apparent reality known as Sataroka. Where the Dhammas of Sankaraloka and beings of the Sataloka coexist is termed the Okasaloka. Yamaka sets out to define and analyze the inner relationship of Dhammas and Pugalas as they exist in these three worlds. Yamaka has the purpose of resolving ambiguity and defining the precise uses of technical terms. An ambiguous nature of a term is avoided by showing how other meaning of the term do not fit for a particular consideration. For example, may all rupa be called rupakanda? The answer is no, because rupa is also used in such expressions as pia rupa. The meaning is lovable nature, ibi rupa, such nature. But there it does not mean rupa kanda. But the question may all rupa kanda be called rupa? The answer is yes, because rupa kanda is a very wide term and includes such a term as pia rupa and iba rupa resolving ambiguity and defining precise usage of a technical term can be found in Yamaka. The last book is Patana. Patana is called the Maha Pakarana, the Great Book. The Great Book announced the supreme position. Patana brings all relationship of Dhamma in a coordinate form to show that the Dhamma do not exist as isolated entity, but they constitute a well-ordered system in which the smallest unit conditions the rest of it and is also being conditioned in return. The arrangement of the system is so very intricate, complex, highly thorough and complete that it earns for this treatise the reputation of being deep and profound. The purpose of the Patana is to apply its scheme of 24 conditional relations to all the phenomena incorporated in the Abhidharma matrix. The main body of the book has four great divisions. Anuloma Patana studies the instance in which Pachaya condition relations do not do I'm sorry do exist between the Dharma. Pachaniya Patana studies the instance in which 
Pacharya relations do not exist between the Dhamma. And Loma Pachaniya Patana studies the instance in which some of Pacharya relations do exist between the Dhamma, but the other do not. Pachaniya and Loma Patana studies the instance in which some of Pachaya relations do not exist between the Dhamma, but the others do exist. Each of these in turn have six subdivisions. The great treatise of Patana arranges all conditioned things under 24 kinds of relation. Patana describes and classifies them into a complex system for understanding the mechanics of the universe of Dharma. So this is the end of Abhidhamma Pitaka. So, uh, so you will solve this question. Um, you can find the answer from the previous slide. So you will solve these questions and then submit answer until June 15th. Okay. And it's the all same pattern. You uh, write down your name and then due date and then this is uh, week 8 and then write down question and write down answer and then submit to my email. And I'm going to address the final research paper. So you will have a final exam on June 22nd and also you're supposed to submit final research paper. So final research paper, choose your favorite sutra in five Nikaya. I limit the research paper in the five Nikaya uh, because Abhidhamma Pitaka is a little bit uh, complicated and it requires more time to prepare the final paper. But if you want to go by Abhidhamma for your research, it's fine with me. But as I say again, it will take a very long time to understand the sutra in Abhidhamma. And if you choose a couple of uh, your favorite sutra in five Nikaya, and uh, first you have to summarize the sutra with the background, such as uh, where was the location in which those discourses were expounded, and then who were the audience. So, the, to whom the discourses were preached and you summarize the content of that sutra and then Buddhist doctrine or principle which is underlined in that sutra. What kind of teaching does Buddha intend to deliver to the audience? And you write down this first part and then you will add your comment uh, address the pros and cons of those sutra by reflecting the idea of sutra in current modern world. And also, uh, you will add, if you were one of audience when the sutra was spoken, what would you ask to the Buddha? Okay. So you attend that Buddha's teaching event and then you're sitting there and then the Buddha preached that sutra, then at the end of that sutra, what do you want to ask to the Buddha? So uh, you will write down, you will study uh, sutra research. And then you can go by one sutra or a couple of sutra, it's okay. If you choose one sutra, but if that sutra is too short, it will be hard to make at least a three page research paper. Okay, so maybe you can choose one or two and then you can summarize each sutra and then if you can add up the relationship between those sutra which you cho choose, that will be another good idea. And then uh, your final research paper must be at least a three page, 12 font size times New Roman in double space. And then the due date is June 22nd. 
As I said, if you choose one sutra in Diga Nikaya, since the length of Diga Nikaya sutra is pretty long, so maybe just one sutra might be enough to make three-page research paper. But if you choose you know, only one sutra from Samyutta Nikaya or sometimes Anguttara Nikaya, I mean, it's too short, so you have to research by looking for reference or commentaries of uh, that sutra, and then you have to involve other critics, other researchers' comment also. So if you want to go by sutra, maybe you can choose one or two, more than two. And then you find some relationship between those two sutras and then there is some consistency can be found from those two sutras so it's all up to you but you have to make at least three page for your final research so if you maybe you already have your favorite sutra and then go by them and then so think about this and next week I might ask about the name of a sutra which you are working for final paper. Okay, so uh, try to screen and then find and choose your favorite sutra first and then um, explore more information. Maybe you can include other scholars comment on that sutra and then you can also add up your opinion. Of that you know maybe commentary or other scholars opinion okay so this is the end of today's lecture